Okay, we can now move to the second speaker of the session. The next speaker is uh, Paul Robertson. Paul is one of the pioneers in the community of Bika, and I think Paul is also a nice example of how you work in industry and academia, and you know you contribute to the two aspects of the research in the field of uh, bio-inspired computation. So he was a professor and scientist at MIT, at uh, UT Dallas, and now is a scientist at uh, Dynamic Object Language Labs, at Lexington, Massachusetts. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm going to uh, give a talk that starts out by trying to convey my enthusiasm for where Beaker can go um, and funnel down to looking at examples from things that we've done over the last uh, more than a decade. So we've had the benefit of working in the area of uh, artificial social intelligence over multiple projects with different goals. And when you do that, certain regularities evolve. Um, so I'm e extremely optimistic, but I'm also a little worried. So why do, why do I keep coming back to Beaker? Why, why do we all come here? I spent 17 hours on planes and countless more in airports. What was it that made this an important thing for me to do this year? And I think it's because we all share a belief in the Beaker idea. But architectures aren't always uh, well received. And uh, we need to be, be careful to be, put our best foot forward and to be respect, respectable in, in what we deliver. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I think we need the Beaker perspective. I think, uh, I think we're lost without having some inspiration from, from the brain and from biology in general, and that's what makes it worth coming back to these meetings. And this meeting is more or less unique. We need to, we need to make sure it works. So one of the ways we can lose is by messing up. And I'm, I'm worried not because of what comes out of our community, but what's coming out in general. Um, there's a lot of nonsense out there. Um, nonsense seems to be a, a constant background noise that we have to deal with. Um, five years ago, it was, it was deep learning networks. I couldn't have any conversation that wasn't somehow related to deep neural networks. Now, um, every single day I'm, I have to face a, some discussion about large language models, transformers, embeddings. Um, what's it going to be five years from now? We need something that has a sort of a longer, a longer term uh, view, and we're not getting it. We're also getting a lot of misinformation, um, and we're taking advantage of the very worst aspects of human intelligence including um, making misleading statements. Um, LLMs don't make things up, and yet that seems to be the perceived view. They, pr they provide the, uh, the word which most probably follows what precedes it. There's no making up there. It doesn't have any idea about the question that you asked. It's producing the next most probable word based on the training that it got. Uh, they, we don't need to invoke the idea of making stuff up because it implies a level of processing that isn't there. We're impressed whenever we see a robot that has an expressive looking face. Um, similarly, when a large language model produces an impressive piece of text, is a, oh my God, that thing is really smart. Um, we, we put away the idea that that was just a mechanism that made the face move in a way that was similar to humans. There's no emotion behind that. 
and there's no intelligence behind the large language model. What there is in there is training based on a, a truly enormous amount of data, the kind of data that no living organism will ever see. Robots aren't dexterous, um, so the idea that robots um, are going to do seriously useful things with their hands um, today is a genius, Those is, is a dream. We need some people in mechanical engineering to push robotics to a point where that's reasonable. Luckily, there are lots of things we can do without physically manipulating, and I'm going to talk about those. So, of course, we want to celebrate the great successes of, of deep learning and large language models, but we need to keep it in perspective and stay focused on what we're really going for. So an important, uh, an important issue is this notion of similarity. Uh, we communicate well with people who are similar to us. Um, I communicate better with people who came from the same background as, as, as I, who have done the same kind of training. We have things in common. We can communicate fluidly and successfully. Um, when I'm in a different culture where I don't understand it, the interaction is less fluid. One of the things that's interesting about large language models and perhaps with um, learning in general is that we convey who we are in the training data that we give to them and with the annotations where, that, where that's a thing. So we're, we are dealing now with a, a synthetic system that was trained to be just like us. If we don't like what comes out of it, we need only to look in the mirror to find where that really came from. So, back in 2012, um, AlexNet um, won by a significant margin um, the ImageNet uh, competition. It caused an immediate sensation. Previous to that, the, the error rates, if you look at 2011, 25.8% error rate. And then suddenly, magic, 16.4% in 2012 with the introduction of uh, deep learning networks. And it was refined to be better than that since. And that has continued to go. And what effect did that have? This is um, statistics on the uh, uh, publications. And it has skyrocketed. It was, uh, at least for a, a, a period of time, an exponential curve in the number of publications in deep learning much of which, um, in my opinion, was simply playing the game of this deep learning stuff really works, what can we do with it? And now I see exactly the same thing with large language models. Everyone is out there trying to uh, see how they can glue a la large language model into their favorite system, and already there are hundreds of applications out there you can already download for your phone or, your, or for your... Uh, uh, laptop. So, uh, large language models communicate about the world the way we do, uh, and there are, there are lots of them. Um, this is the second phase. So the first phase was seeing the world the way we do. We gave it examples of things in the world and annotated what they were and suddenly they can see and understand or at least identify the objects in the world. That was the holy grail for um, machine vision, to be able to name the objects in an image scene and suddenly we can do that. That, that allows a lot of applications. Now we have the same thing for language. We now have something that trained on a massive amount of data is able to communicate in natural language. And as we've seen from prior speakers, we can use those um, as a sub-module. And I'll explain how, in fact, we are, we are already doing that. Um, 
This is an example I, I tapped in uh, just last night. Um, in less than 200 words, explain the key message that H.G. Wells wanted to convey about humanity in his novel, The War of the Worlds, and it produced that piece of text. In The War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells explores the theme of human vulnerability in the face of an overwhelmingly superior force. The novel serves as a cautionary tale about potential consequences of unchecked imperialism and technological hubris. As Martians invade Earth with advanced weaponry, Wells highlights humanity's susceptibility to external threats and the fragility of our civilization. The narrative underscores the limits of human power and the humbling realization that despite our accomplishments, we are not the ultimate masters of the universe. By portraying the Martians as formidable invaders, Wells prompts readers to reflect on the consequences of their own actions and the importance of humanity in the face of unknown of the unknown. Ultimately, the war of the world suggests that our survival is contingent on a nuanced understanding of our place in the cosmos and responsibility that comes with yielding advanced technology. Was that an example of uh, a large language model understanding uh, the book of H.G. Wells? Um, where did that come from? Um, you already all know the answer to that. I'm just pointing out that how easy it is for the general public to see examples like that and have no doubt that we're dealing with a solved Intel AI. But we're so far from that, we need architectures. For speech recognition, um, there are examples out there that use um, transformer technology like Whisper. We're using Whisper in several of our projects. Works very well. These are things that can be put into a greater learning environment, a greater intelligent architecture, and, and used successfully to build. They, these form the underpinning of the enthusiasm and optimism that I described at the beginning. They're not the end point. Um, we're not almost there. We're not almost done. And the bit that's missing comes from this community, the biologically, sorry, the brain-inspired cognitive architecture. It's important that we build things that are useful. Um, Jeff Hinton, who I knew from way back, um, spent his life trying to get people to take um, deep learning seriously. And he finally, uh, he finally decided that, based on some advice he was given, that if he could win a competition, that would enable um, deep learning to be respected and that ImageNet competition in 2012 changed the direction. People want things that work, and if we make things that work, then they will, they will take them. And we will have the massive influx of funding that we saw after 2012, and, uh, and we will be respected. So, I mentioned that I've been working in artificial social intelligence, and I'm going to dig in on that. And, and part of what I want to show is um, commonalities that come out of very differently inspired programs um, that I think um, we can drill down on. And my enthusiasm is that we can have assistants that uh, show a level of intelligence that's useful. And I want to give an idea of what that is and how we get there. So just, just to try and make a distinction between a tool and an assistant, um, a tool may be something that's useful for providing information um, like a GPS or a question answering system. An assistant um, works to provide support directly or by providing timely information and works with teams to make them work better or more efficiently. An assistant isn't someone that you give them low-level commands to do and they go off and do them. An assistant is someone that's there to pick up the pieces that you've dropped, to be proactive about things that need to be done, not annoy you by telling you things that you already know. I think that slide is a good one to skip and, and leave in there. This, uh, this hexagon um, sort of sums up 
um, what's emerged for us after um, four projects in um, artificial social intelligence about what is meant by social intelligence. I, I had a slide that showed the definitions dating back to um, um, 1920. But this is, this is what I think has emerged for us. Um, the, so, the social part and the intelligence part. So the social part um, has been summed up as knowing when to act. When, when should the assistant intervene in some way? And the arrow there is bi-directional. And what I mean by that is that the social intelligence knows when to act and then does act, that's the outward going. And then it learns from how successful or otherwise that action was so that it, the incoming arrow is, represents learning when to act. And we all learn when to interact. We are social creatures. We, we try things out in social settings and some of them fail, some of them succeed. And we learn how to say just the right thing at just the right time. Collaboration, social. Social intelligence is all about working collaborative. That's what makes human beings so great and what can make our AI great as well. Um, we learn to collaborate just like we learn when is the right time to act. So the arrow is both ways and we form collaborations. In fact, we have another uh, project about emergent collaboration and we don't, it's too early to give results about that. But collaboration is a, a key part of social intelligence. We wouldn't need to communicate if we weren't looking to collaborate. And we need to understand the state of others, which um, was referred, to, was mentioned before as theory of mind. And it's not just what the others know, but it's the other aspects of what's going on in their head. How stressed are they? How tired are they? If a person is very tired, that might need, mean that they need to be relieved of some of their efforts because they might make mistakes. So we all have models of what other people know. I can't say anything to anyone if I don't already have a model of what they already know. Uh, we have models of what people know, generally and specifically. So the, um, the Sally Ann test that was shown before um, is an example of where the child knows that a knows a particular fact based on what one person saw and what another person didn't see. But there was also all of the rest of the emotional state that goes in, I'm not going to approach that person and suggest something because I can see they're not going to take it well. The emotional part and the tiredness part, the cognitive load parts are all part of that problem. So together those three represent things that we can compare different ASI, um, artificial social intelligence, to see are they learning those things or are they pre-programmed? Are they intervening when they should or shouldn't? Are they forming collaborations? Are they, are they recognizing the emotional state of the people that they're dealing with, yes or no? The intelligence part, um, we have perception of vision. Do we, do we see the world the way humans do? Um, do can we put the pieces together um, with, for causality? So the actual recognizing the objects in the world, um, large language models, I'm sorry, uh, deep, deep learning is providing uh, fairly high rates of success there, but understanding how things work is, is still a hard problem. Um, natural language, using it to understand what's being said or to produce it. And knowledge, where does knowledge come from? Um, and can we learn it in real time? And can we, can, we, um, can we use that knowledge in beneficial ways to act when necessary and, and to collaborate? So, whoops, I had forgot to advance my little target. So to try and underline this, um, I've made um, some scorecards to compare different, different projects, and we're going to look at those. So look at GPS. Um, GPS doesn't see or understand. Um, let's be clear, the GPS knows, knows where it is in a um, three-dimensional coordinate system. 
but it doesn't see anything around it. Um, it doesn't have bidirectional language, although that could easily be done by adding large language models so that we can talk to our GPS. It doesn't learn anything. It doesn't know when to act. It just acts. My GPS, I leave my GPS on in my car as I'm driving to work. I go to the same place every single day. Um, I know the way. The GPS is useful if there's an accident or if there's some diversion. It can recommend different, different routes. If I didn't know the way, I would need it to tell me. But I don't, and it's annoying because I'm usually listening to a particularly nice piece of music by Mozart, and it's turning, telling me to turn right and then turn right again and then join, join the highway. I don't need that, but it gives it to me anyway because that piece is lacking. All right. Looks like I... So with, with Alexa, the one thing that it does have is bidirectional use of language but uh, I was generous in giving it a tick there because it really isn't learning anything. The learning direction of the arrow um, shouldn't be there. Similarly for chat GPT, it only gets a tick on bidirectional use of language, but there too it doesn't have any real-time learning. So let's look at a project that we started in 20, um, yeah, about 12 years ago. Um, this uh, video, please. Here we built a system. Progress in accomplishing the activities of the repair task. Actually, can you kill the audio? Computer. Open cart. Never mind. It doesn't Welcome last very to long. Welcome cart. What would you like to repair? Please say new repair, followed by the type of object. New repair smartphone. Okay. I found the repair plan for smartphone. Start repair. The repair plan for smartphone was successfully started. All right, I'm going to cut that short so that I don't run out of time. Oh, that's ideal. Here, um, by ingesting a large number of repairs manuals, we were able to have a robot. This was the first version, the very, very first version. Later on, we had a... Stop. the user's progress and go. Okay, so the, the very first version had a robot that didn't actually move. The second one had a robot where part of its task was to get a good vantage point to see what was going on. It could recognize when the human operator made a mistake and could plan a recovery from that mistake. An example would be like putting a cover back um, without putting a piece that needed to be under the cover before doing that. So there's a, an order of things that can be done that come from the instruction manuals for, for doing the repair. And it watches what's happening without saying anything, without being annoying. And when it observes a mistake, it then plans a recovery from the mistake and talks the human through the process of undoing the mistake and continuing on with the repair. So that's an example of where it has ingested a large amount of information about repair manuals. It can use them to watch and understand. It doesn't... On the other hand, when it sees that the human is hesitating, it's picked up a piece and isn't moving forward um, with the repair, then um, Cart decides that the human is probably lost and could use a little help. It doesn't give the help for every step, the way a GPS does, but when it notices that the human is, um, is hesitating or if the human makes a mistake, then it jumps in. That's assistance, and that's the kind of thing that we're looking for in, in, in assistance. So another one started in 2019, which hasn't completely finished, but it is very close. Uh, builds upon many technologies. The idea here is to have an assistant that builds on um, collaboration. It doesn't actually intervene in, in any operations directly like a robot. It simply um, gives, in, gives interventions that attempt to lead people to collaborate better. So this is an interesting part of um, not using a physical robot, but using language. So language, we use language to write programs in other people's brains. Uh, the 
the, the actuator of this virtual robot is, the human, is in the human brain. The, the system can attempt to change what the person knows or what the person believes by its interventions. This is perhaps more powerful than any, any manipulation that we could do with a robotic hand. We can take our humans and we can reprogram their brain to believe what we want them to do. And what we want them to do in this case is to collaborate better, but um, think of the, uh, of the human brain as an infinitely programmable and modifiable unit that our AI can manipulate by telling it things, whether they're true or false, in order to change their behavior. One thing we need to know, as I mentioned before, is what they know already. And there we have um, the theory of mind. Um, I don't think I need to really go over this again because it's duplicative of what we were already shown before. But we have multiple levels of belief, that I believe, that you believe, that I believe, that you believe, that I'm from another planet. Humans can deal with this. Um, most people seem to think that three levels is more than adequate and perhaps a lot of people argue that two levels is enough. And yet humans can clearly go, go deeper. But the deeper we go, um, there's a scaling problem here. Um, how do we deal with it? Um, dynamic epistemic logic provides uh, a framework for representing uh, beliefs. It's a doxastic logic, which means it deals not only with, no with knowledge, but also about beliefs. So it has uh, primitives in its um, formulation for representing what is known and what is believed. So this is an example um, that was shown at ICAPS a year ago, I think it was, of a robot that could solve the Sally Ann problem. And fortunately, I don't have to explain the Sally Ann problem. There are these three boxes, and this person standing there will put the red box in the red object in box one. Then he will go out the room, and someone else will come back and take the box out of one and put it into two, exactly the way it was shown earlier. And the robot keeps track using dynamic epistemic logic to understand that when the person comes in, he has a false belief about where the red box is and demonstrates that. I'm not going to show the video because it's too repetitive of what we've already seen. The point is that uh, <coughs> robots can maintain these structures of belief and can also plan. So along with, um, with epistemic logic comes epistemic planning, where you can plan what other people believe. So this is where we can, just as we would plan a set of steps like um, pour, pour coffee into the cup and then lift the cup and drink it, we can develop little plans like that for, to explain how the robot should drink its coffee. Here we can do epistemic planning to generate, perhaps using large language models, um, interventions that place those modifications into the human's brain to, a, to achieve a different outcome. So the epistemic planning, when your actuators are sentences that are just what the person believes and knows, particularly if you have feedback from emotional responses, we can have, imagine, a very powerful system that can um, lead people to, perhaps lead kids to um, deal with conflict in class better or th things like anything you can think of that involves manipulating human brains is in scope with this. So, and there's a Sally, an example, and some representations of that um, using these graphical models, which I won't go into. I, whoops. Well, I skipped over that one, which is a pity because that was work from one of the uh, members of our project who has worked with robots um, using the um, virtual home simulation environment to deal with um, reasoning about what other, what the human 
understands about constraints about drinking coffee. So you, you drink coffee out of a cup, you drink orange out of a glass. And if it, if it starts out assuming that the human knows that you drink coffee out of a cup and orange out of a glass, its behavior is different than if it thinks that's not the case. If the human behaves in a way that seems to indicate that they, they don't know that or there's a sufficient ambiguity, it can produce an intervention that says, by the way, we drink orange out of a glass, not out of a cup. So there it's, it's planning to implant that bit of knowledge that was missing in the human into the human brain so that the human's behavior thereafter will be, will be different. And this is a PhD student at MIT that I've been working with under this project. And she um, is from Shanghai. But she's not coming back, she's staying with us. Can't have her, okay? Um, this is uh, this is the um, the playground for reasoning about um, if the mental states of the participants. Here we have three players. Um, they are doing search and rescue. They go. the The lines show the paths that they have already taken. They go from room to room. They, um, they identify victims that need medical help. They, there is someone that takes the role of transporter that moves them to a safe place where they can get that medical help. They have to work together as a team. There's one person who can remove rubble that's fallen from a collapsed ceiling. There's one that's a medic that can determine the triage state of the, of the victims that they find, and a transporter that moves them. And if they work together really well and efficiently, they can go through this building and move the uh, injured victims to safety very, very quickly. And if that collaboration isn't there, it doesn't happen. So our ASI makes interventions to manipulate the brains of those three players to be better collaborators and ultimately get better scores in this game. Uh, to call. Yeah, there was a video there as well, but... So uh, we've, talk, we've talked about logic or representation of what is known and what is believed and epistemic and doxastic logic. But what about emotional states? Um, I may need to give one example due to time. Here's one on cognitive load. Um, we measure cognitive load by looking at what, pe what the players have seen. This, the three colors show the transporter, the medic, and the engineer. And when they see things that are not finished, those have to remain in their, in their memory. They're, they're a load. If there are too many of them, they can start making mistakes. And with this, um, we can measure, just based on what we know that they have seen, what the current cognitive load is, which uh, I won't go into describing it, but it's represented in bits. When the cognitive load is too high, that's when mistakes start to happen. The red guy is carrying um, a lot of the load at this point. Thank you. Uh, similarly, we can... Yeah, so that one was going to show... Oh, here we go. No, maybe not. Let's skip over that one. That was going to show where... Um, where the cognitive load was distributed, because if we want to give an intervention that says you should, you should help your, your guy who's got this heavy cognitive load, we also need to say what that person should be doing. This guy has way too much X on his plate, so you need to do, unload some of that X, so his cognitive load will be less because you're relieving him of, of some work. So this one was, was Rita. Um, So it establishes um, collaborations. This is the, the way that it interacts by providing English language collaborations. And I sh should also say that this system uses story understanding. It represents um, what's going on as short stories and that our collaboration with MIT used the Genesis story understanding system so that it learned um, 
to identify when something is breaking down by having stories like, like sailors will tell about when they were out at sea and something, something happened, or in aviation, when someone makes a mistake, they report it into the ASR system uh, to help other people not make the same mistake. We can ingest those stories and use them to have a, an ASI that can deliver good interventions uh, to, pre, to incre, improve the performance, the, improve the import, performance of doing search and rescue, improve the performance of soldiers, pro, improve the performance of students or young children in school. So, the latest project, uh, Lisa, uh, the primary motivation here is the ingest, automatic ingestion of massive amounts of information. Let's say you, China's a big country, there are a large number of people here. What if you have um, information on all of those people? What can you do with it? Um, if you have information on every airplane that was ever built or every airway, every airport, what can you do with that? So we're looking at, uh, our funders want to see how to motivate these new technologies to extract every bit of usefulness out of that information. We can automatically ingest massive amounts of data. In this project, we're dealing with with an aviation domain. We're ingesting all the av aviation domain, including stories. And the three goals are the just-in-time, that, that is that our agents deliver an intervention just in time, not after the crash, but just before the crash. They should deliver just enough, don't tell the person too much, um, which means we have to have a model of how much that person knows before we generate the intervention. And just for me, so that's the just for the person that you're giving the intervention to. Knowing everything you know about that person how much do you need to give? That, that's what we do when we have a conversation with anyone. I know how much you know. Uh, I don't waste my time t telling you about dynamic epistemic logic if I know you've been researching that for the last few years. And my GPS shouldn't tell me to turn right when I, I know, and it knows that I know. And to my great surprise, it turns out to be really successful. Uh, we've done human research um, a human research study um, just a few months ago in which we had um, a large number of participants. We had a, a system that didn't provide interventions and another one um, using our ASI technology and um, using hooked into the Microsoft Flight Simulator so it could understand the, the flights, what, everything that was going on. With interventions, no one crashed. And without the interventions, two-thirds of them crashed. We gave them rather challenging assignments. And people crash in simulators more often than they do in real planes. But the point is that the, the difference was dramatic between um, intervening at just the right time with just the right amount of information tailored for the person it was delivered to. We saved virtual lives. This, is, this shows the... Uh, we have a pilot, co-pilot team, and the third one who's in a different room is air traffic control. This, this is a team. I was talking about collaboration. This is um, artificial social intelligence. So uh, the core part of this, we're dealing with a team, not with individuals. It's not the GPS that's telling me how to get to work. We're trying to make that team work in the cockpit successfully, even if they haven't flown before. So these people were fairly fairly new, which is why they had, had a lot of crashes. But the point is, it's a team here we're dealing with, not individuals. In the Boeing 737 MAX crashes, there was a, a sim very simple solution that was documented in the manuals for how to override the, um, the MCAS system that led to the crashes. The pilots died before they found it. Um, our system, having ingested all of those manuals, can can tell them exactly what they need to know, exactly where that button is that they have to press, and that could have saved them. So this is, this is technology that is ready for transition. Our project isn't ours, it's fundamental research, but the idea is that we can be, make these systems that ingest massive amounts of data, and there's our scorecard. Lisa fills in more of the boxes, the ideal ASI on the right would have ticks on all of them. 
And of course, numbers would probably better, be better in those boxes, but for the purpose of this pr presentation, ticks and crosses seemed better. So that's, that's essentially it. Um, I want Cognitive architectures are great because they um, provide at a very general level things that need to fit together. And I tried to give you examples of six dimensions. Six dimensions that we can measure so that when we talk to the press, we can tell them, yeah, we've still got a long way to go. And this is, these are the things we can do and these are the things we can't do. Um, and a biological cognitive architecture doesn't constrain us too much, just like um, um, just like architectures, um, the von Neumann architecture, for example, doesn't tell us anything about what technology to use for the memory. Um, and within that simple framework, we, we have built computer science. We need a similar thing, inspired by biology, inspired by the brain, that will serve the role that the von Neumann architecture d provided for uh, um, for computer science. Thank you. I think we have time for two questions. You can choose the speaker. The... Wenji? Go ahead. Why do I need this? Um, doesn't this work? Thank you very much, Paul, <laughs> for the insightful speaking. And I basically have the question towards the architecture design is, uh, as far as we know nowadays, there are many cognitive architectures or compute, uh, computing architectures, basically. And then most of the time, there would be a set of requirements for the design or implementation, like uh, certain capabilities or mechanisms. And as I have seen in your presentation, there is kind of um, the scorecards or uh, the a set of requirements for the system. After I can no, uh, what kind of rules are you observing to design or to determine such a set of requirements for the design which you think is um, necessary and sufficient for, for the implementation of the system? Thank you. That's a great question, thank you. So let me be, be very clear. Um, I'm pushing for uh, brain-inspired cognitive architectures because I think they're important. And they, they don't over-constrain, but they, get, they guide us. I was very careful not to include such a diagram in my slide set. I wasn't pushing for any particular one. In my opinion, the architectures that exist at the moment are too closely related to a particular implementational choice. I think we can do better. The scorecards were an attempt to condense what we've learned from these four projects in ASI, what similarities, what bits are missing, when you've, when you've been working for 12 years on something, hopefully you've learned something, and this, those scorecards are a sort of condensation of what I've learned. I'm not claiming that they're right or complete. Uh, I'm throwing them out there because if we have scorecards like that, we don't, get, we don't have to deal with the AI has been solved, I just saw ChatGPT write this incredible paragraph, and so we're all doomed. The way we, we combat that is, yes, we've made fantastic progress, and bravo, but we're not there yet, and, and in fact, we're not even that close, but we're certainly a lot closer than we were a year ago. So it's just your open question. Um, may I ask a second one if uh, I'm allowed? No. All right. You can ask me later. Go. and the influence of artificial intelligence. We conducted an uh, experiment, uh, experiment um, modern communication uh, between monolinguals and uh, bilinguals is uh, similar to the style of communication of uh, epileptic-like uh, style Fyodor Dostoevsky. And uh, sometimes the psych uh, psyche uh, of the is normal. It look like a, a, a pseudo pato uh, cycle linguistic phenomena, uh, but then a revision of uh, speech and uh, behavioral norms is needed. Uh, in this case, the model of artificial intelligence training will also change. 
uh, or will artificial intelligence translate uh, the old norms of communication? Thank you. Sorry, Nervous. So, uh, um, so I mentioned that we were using Whisper to uh, extract. Um, we text. make we made uh, uh, um, uh, experience in Russia, in Kazakhstan, Greece, and Australia too. And these hmm. uh, general results. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, Whisperer is amazingly successful at people speaking with different um, pronunciation um, foreign speakers because it's trained on a very large number of, of speakers, um, which, and it deals nicely with background noise, so it's a useful um, tool if you just want to get a translation of what the person said into, into, into words. It does much better than other tools that, that we had tried for that reason. What it doesn't tell us is all the other useful stuff that, that we need for our models when we try to get emotional state. So when I'm talking to you, I can see whether you're frustrated that I'm not answering the question that you asked, or I'm not saying the things you want me to say. It's, it's all written in your face, and it's all written in the way that you speak. And there are lots of people working on recognizing signs of emotions in speech and in facial expressions. And um, it's essential for humans to communicate, to know, is the, pers is the interlocutor actually very bored with what I'm saying? Because that's a cue that I should talk about something else or, or shut up. Um, having fluid interactions between ASIs and humans means that the ASI have to be as good as we are at detecting the, these little signs. And if I didn't answer exactly the question, let's, let's chat outside. Thank you. I think we have to stop here at this time, Paul. Thank you. So is Tim Ting of some of the organizers here to explain what we do next? So if, where is lunch? Is it included? With the voucher that you gave us, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, so the lunch is upstairs in the second floor. We'll see you later. At the, as the program says. Thank you.